Presiding officer, I will start this speech and end it in the same way to say that I'm angry. I'm angry that in I'm angry that in 20 I'm angry, presiding officer, because. so surprised when the most senior positions in Scotland are filled almost exclusively by those who are white. But take my portfolio alone. The Lord President, white. The Lord Justice Clark, white. Every High Court judge, white. The Lord Advocate, white. The Solicitor General, white. The Chief Constable, white. Every Deputy Chief Constable, white. Every Assistant Chief Constable, white. The Head of the Law Society, white. The head of the Faculty of Advocates, white. Every prison governor, white. And not just justice. The chief medical officer, white. The chief nursing officer, white. The chief veterinary officer, white. The chief social work advisor, white. Almost every trade union in this country headed by people who are white. In the Scottish government, every director general is white. Every chair of every public body is white. The clip you have just watched of the Scottish Justice Minister Hamza Youssef criticising Scotland for being run by white people raises a number of questions in a country which is overwhelmingly white. According to the 2011 census, Scotland is 96% white. 20 years ago, at the 2001 census, it was 98% white. The 1991 census is the earliest I've been able to find in which ethnicity is recorded. Then Scotland was 99% white. That was the world that the Lord President of the Court of Session, the first name on Mr Youssef's list, grew up in. Why should his skin colour make the Justice Minister as angry as he says he was? He was simply one of the 99%. What colour does Mr Youssef think Jock Tamson was? And Lord Carloway was only first on a long list of people who was disparaged in this way. Almost all the top officials around Scotland apparently do not meet with Mr Youssef's approval on account of their race. Whether this in itself amounts to racism, I will leave for the viewer to judge. In my view, it is certainly mannerless, but beyond that, and perhaps more significantly, it was a cowardly attack. You will notice that Mr Youssef starts his list with the judges. These are people who are bound by a venerable and sensible constitutional convention to the effect that they never answer public criticism or engage in any form of extrajudicial controversy. And that would include racial taunts from politicians with an axe to grind. The same self-denying convention would probably apply to the chief medical officer, the prison governors and all the other people that the justice minister refers to. Why does he only attack those who cannot hit back? Why does he not draw attention to the fact that all of his own cabinet colleagues are white? Even the first minister is white. But that is not mentioned. I wonder why. Anyway, in the larger context of the hate crime bill, that seems to me trivial. The scheme has many more defects than merely the colour conscious attitude of its sponsor. These defects have been covered very widely in the press and I do not propose to repeat them here. I wish to make only three points, each of which is suggested by my research into Soviet and Russian history, and none of which has been much covered in the media. But before I get into all of that, I want to put my views in a personal context, as I think these have some more general relevance to this issue. I'm not unique, I think, in having changed my view of the SNP over the years, and this hate crime bill represents an important stage in that change. For 30 years I voted for SNP, thinking that Scotland was badly treated by England, and then it really was England, unlike now, when it would be better to talk of Britain in the governing context. 
The main reason I did so was that I thought a Scottish Parliament, which I strongly supported, would throw off many of the ludicrous English-based restrictions on life here, which we suffer from quite needlessly. And I will give just one example. In the opening chapter of a book I published in 2004, Isles of the North, A Voyage to the Realms of the Norse, I wrote about the absurdity of the fact that the houses in the Isle of Barra and the Outer Hebrides, where I sailed, had the shape of their windows dictated by a policy whose roots lay in the Town and Country Planning Act of 1947. The aim of that act was to safeguard the south of England, and especially its farming and semi-rural areas, from too much insensitive urban spillover development. A laudable aim, you might say. But why should that mean that the windows in the Isle of Barra have to look like those installed in the 19th and early 20th centuries? They were small then, because windows were sources of cold in houses that were heated by hard-won peat, lifted from a bog that was probably not very close by. Heat had to be conserved, so windows were small. Today we have double glazing and central heating, and we want, especially in a place like Barra, to be able to see the scenery outside. We want large plate glass windows, double glazed of course, and these do not conform to the pattern of the late 19th century. But that is not allowed because of the English sentimentality about the loss of the traditional character of so-called rural settlements, which in 1947 really meant home counties England. Due to the centralised nature of the British state, that also meant Barra. Sadly, it still does. That is absurd, and an example of insensitive government which I hope the Parliament in Edinburgh might rectify. In my book, I contrasted the situation on Barra with that on the similar island of Bramanga in Norway, where I sailed later in that voyage. There I saw a house with a bedroom which had glass walls on three sides. You can see a picture of it in the book, this beautiful room faced into the birch forest. It was absolutely enchanting. Why was that sort of thing outlawed in Scotland? It was in order to find a lawful way of rectifying that sort of situation that I voted to the SNP and the Scottish Parliament. In 1999, the Parliament I had voted for was opened in Edinburgh. By 2007, it was in the hands of the SNP. Surely that was the moment when the sort of changes that I'd been envisaging might be expected to have come about. However, the SNP's approach to government, I soon learned, had nothing to do with trying to increase personal freedom in Scotland. Quite the reverse. It was to increase state control by the elite in Holyrood and St Andrew's House. Since gaining power, the SNP has criminalised life here at twice the rate that the Westminster Parliament has criminalised life in England. I'll give supporting detail to that statement later on. But here it's enough to say that I perceived an authoritarian mind which, when combined with the traditional bureaucracy of Scotland, began to assume an uglier and less freedom-orientated aspect. Then I went to live in Russia, where I ended up staying for 12 years, researching my next book, which is to be called Russia and the Rule of Law. From my vantage point in the outskirts of Moscow, I began to see ominous parallels between the Russian and the SNP approaches to government. I came back to Scotland in 2018 and, while still working on the history of Russian constitutional law, wrote an account of the origins of authoritarian government in Scotland today, set in its own historical context. This was published recently under the title The Justice Factory – Can the Rule of Law Survive in 21st Century Scotland? That was not a title intended to shock, though it did shock some of the more establishment-minded figures who read it in Edinburgh. However, I'm happy to say that some very major figures expressed full support. Perhaps the most significant was Lord Hope of Craig Head, the ex-Lord President of the Court of Session and, until he retired in 2015, the Deputy President of the UK Supreme Court. He kindly wrote the foreword to the book, and the leading authority on constitutional law in Scotland, Professor Alan Page of the University of Dundee, wrote an introduction to part two of the book. Clearly they saw something ominous in the way the darkening shadows of rule by law, as opposed to the rule of law, are falling across Scotland under a narrowly nationalist government. Freedom is under threat, and if we do not resist, it will vanish. That, at least, is my view. 
and it is to do my one five millionth part of the national job of trying to avert this outcome that I wrote that book and have made this film. It seems to me that the hate crime bill, for reasons I will discuss shortly, represents the ultimate in the Putinization of Scottish politics. It purports to control our thoughts, to nationalise, as it were, the mind of the Scottish people, that is, you and me. This is not only illiberal, it is also profoundly un-Scottish. Every nation has its own history, and Scotland has a particularly interesting history, one aspect of which is that Scots have rarely been happy to be told what to think by government. Till recently, that meant government in London. Today, it means Holyrood. The assertion of personal liberty, of both action and conscience, goes back to at least the Reformation. It must not now be swept away in a tide of politically correct authoritarianism. That, at least, is my position. Now to the film. I'm going to make just three points. The first is about Mr Yousaf himself, the proposer of this measure. I want to examine briefly what his qualifications are for altering the direction of Scottish law and thought in the way he proposes. Secondly, I am going to discuss the way in which Mr Yousaf's bill echoes the approach of the Soviet Union and its inheritor in terms of governing style, Mr Putin. Finally, I want to suggest that the only possible motive for proposing this bill is to establish a form of police state in Scotland. Let me start, Mr. Yousaf. When the Bolsheviks seized power in 1917, one of Lenin's first acts was to dissolve the Russian imperial justice system. From now on, he said, and I quote, anybody can act as a judge basing himself on the revolutionary sense of justice of the working classes, end quote. Millions of acts of brutality, revenge and murder resulted from that misplaced confidence in the sense of justice of the working classes. It took Stalin years to prevent the resulting chaos from undermining the entire structure of the state, and Stalin himself hardly had a sense of justice that we would view with admiration. Luckily in Scotland we have an experienced and learned corps of judges all of whom have a highly developed sense of justice. They are described in some detail in the first part of the Justice Factory. However, what we do not have is a learned and experienced man making laws for them to apply. And that is the subject of the second part of the Justice Factory. The Minister of Justice, Hamza Youssef, has little experience of anything outside politics. His CV shows that he has done a certain amount of charity work, but he has never been in business or a profession or even learned a trade. Like all his colleagues in the cabinet, he has had no experience of building up a company by satisfying a wide range of customers in a competitive market whose rules are governed by law. He's not even worked in the creative industries or played professional sport. In fact, if the Scottish Parliament website is to be believed, he has never had a job of any sort outside politics, apart from four months working in a call centre while he was still at university. Mr Youssef was born in 1985 and graduated with a degree in politics in 2007. For two years after that, he worked as parliamentary assistant to Bashir Ahmad, Scotland's first and widely respected Muslim MSP, who sadly died in 2009. Two years after that... Yousaf became the youngest member of the Scottish Parliament and was immediately appointed to the Justice Committee, despite his lack of experience and expert knowledge. A year later, he was made Minister for External Affairs and International Development, even though his knowledge of that world, too, was also not extensive. The media credited him with two marriages, both of them to SNP party workers. Like Miss Sturgeon, he has, so to speak, married within the craft, in fact, he does not appear to have had much of a life outside the Holyrood bubble. In that sense, he is like most of his cabinet colleagues. Hardly any of them has much experience of the world of productive work. Much more importantly, Yousaf seems to know very little about the traditions of Scots law. And in law, tradition is very important since, in a common law system, it is a cumulative body of knowledge. I think it's legitimate in the circumstance to ask what Mr Yousaf can, with the education and life experiences he's had to date, 
be assumed to know about the history of the Court of Session, or of the King's Justiciars in Scotland, or of the law of the Highland Chieftains, or of Oodal Law in the Northern Isles, or of the threats to national legal systems of all sorts that opposed by the deliberately camouflaged integrationism of the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, as explored in my video review of the Oxford Handbook of European Legal History, which is number 56 in the series. What can Mr. Youssef be expected to know of the lights of Viscount Stair or of Mackenzie of Rosehall, who wrote foundational treatises of, respectively, civil law and criminal law in Scotland? Has he read the magisterial seven-volume History of the Law of Scotland by Professor David Walker, which amounts to an entire history of this country from a political, legal point of view? In fact, it's such a fascinating work that I plan to cover it in one of my future video reviews on Ian Mitchell's book recommendations. Reading Walker might teach Mr Youssef something of the great judges of the Scottish past, like Lord Braxfield or Lord Coburn, the author of the imperishable book of judicial reminiscences, Circuit Journeys. He might even learn something about Scottish nationalism from reading about Lord Cooper, who presided as Lord President of the Court of Session over the Royal Titles case in 1953, in which he discussed the issue of the sovereignty of Parliament and its limits. And what does Mr Youssef know of all those Scottish judges who have made such an important contribution to the work of the House of Lords over the last 150 years or so? Culminating in the fact that today, the two Scottish judges out of the 12 who sit on its successor, the United Kingdom Supreme Court, are respectively the President, Lord Reid, and the Vice President, Lord Hodge. That is a high honour for so small a jurisdiction, despite the colour of their skin. But more importantly, it is surely reasonable to say that without some knowledge of the history of Scots law, it is difficult to justify destroying important aspects of it, like the rule of corroboration, to take one example relevant to the hate crime bill. Law and history are related aspects of a single national story. No one appreciated this more than Sir Walter Scott, who was recently the subject of a fascinating lecture subtitled Law and Imagination, delivered by Lord Stuart, a Campbelltown man incidentally, who spoke at the Stair Society of which he is president. Since it was formed in 1934, this body has done more than any other to disseminate knowledge of the history of Scots law. Lord Stuart had this to say about Scott and his appreciation of the inextricable link between law and history. In the autumn of 1789, Scott's classes included Professor Dougal Stuart's Moral Philosophy course and Universal History, presented by the practicing advocate Alexander Fraser Teitler later Lord Woodhouse Lee, now on screen. The latter explained the connection between law and society through history. The idea of the mutual contingency of Scots law and Scottish society stamped the novelist's thinking for the rest of his life. Does Mr Yusuf appreciate any of this? And what exactly is the level of his knowledge of Scots law and history? I think he should tell us if he wants to avoid being tarred by the same brush as Lenin's disastrous revolutionary tribunals. In my view, it is high time we had a little openness and transparency on this subject. And on the subject of Mr Youssef's apparent um, lack of complete familiarity, let's put it no higher than that, with Scots law and Scots legal history, which I think he can not escape blame for the context of a bill like this which made such a radical attack on traditions. I'd like to quote Professor Walker, who I mentioned earlier on in connection with his seven-volume history of Scots law, possibly the most remarkable piece of legal history ever written in Scotland. He was the Regis Professor of Law at Glasgow University, succeeded, I should add, by Joe Thompson, another Campbelltown man. Anyway, Professor Walker wrote in his other book, The Scottish Legal System, that, and I quote, Scots law is part of Scots heritage. He then went on to say the greatest threat to it, and I quote again, lies in Scotland, in the apathy and ignorance of Scotsmen, in their failure to study, cherish, conserve, restate and develop their traditional principles. Now, if this hate crime bill illustrates one thing to me, it is just that. 
The ignorance of a particular Scotsman who happens at the moment to be Minister of Justice and his failure to study, cherish, conserve, restate and develop the traditional principles of Scots law is what is going to lead us to disaster. And my final quotation from Professor Walker is this. The Scottish legal tradition is in danger, like so many other national and traditional institutions. And one of the dangers is the tendency, and I'm quoting again, to abolish the well-settled and replace by untried new and from the modern ignorance of the value of native law. Modern ignorance of the value of native law. Such tendencies will spell the end of what is left of Scotland's independent life and culture, her law included. The Hate Crime Bill says, amongst other things, that a person commits an offence if he communicates abusive material to another person and as a result it is likely that hatred will be stirred up against the group. Now, I would say that when he spoke in Parliament, as shown at the beginning of this film, Mr Youssef was definitely communicating. It is clear also that his message emphasised race or colour in an polite tone. So it wait, seems to me conceivable wait, wait, that at least one wait, person in wait, Scotland, wait, which is all wait, the bill requires wait, to initiate wait, a prosecution, wait, 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 might think that hatred was being stirred up both by what Mr Youssef said and by the way in which he said it. Moreover, the bill says in Section 1 that an offence is aggravated, which means it will carry a heavier sentence, if it is, quote, motivated wholly or partly by malice and ill will towards a group of persons based on the group being defined with reference to a characteristic mentioned in subsection 2, end quote. The groups defined in subsection 2 include subsection C, which covers, quote, race colour, nationality, including citizenship, or ethnic and or national origins. End quote. It seems to me pretty clear that to call a group of people white in the angry tone which Mr Youssef used would be an open and shut case of aggravated hate crime. If the average Scot who is white had referred to Mr Youssef's race in the way Mr Youssef did about the judges and others, they would be quite likely to find themselves under investigation by the Minister of Justice's proposed attitude squad. But now we have a man at, sitting at the cabinet table who wants to become a 21st century guardian of public morals, yet without knowing much about the long and often dark history of moralistic aggression in Scotland. How much does he know of Bloody Mackenzie and the use of judicial torture? Yet Mr Youssef wants to use physical force in the form of the police and the courts against unconvicted people, as if they are political terrorists. The police will be able to force entry into your house in order to seize your computer and books so they can check another person's allegation that you've offended the standards of Yousafian hate-related etiquette. If you have the wrong books on your shelves, you face being sent to jail for up to seven years and or being forced to pay an unlimited fine. The same thing will happen, the Justice Minister assures us, if impermissible words are spoken over the dinner table. In fact, anything in the privacy of your own home is now going to be public business. Welcome to my bookshelves. As you can probably see, I now share a house with books rather than the other way round. Uh, these shelves here are fiction. Um, probably one of my most prized possessions, which is a signed uh, first edition copy of this book, uh, which I treasure. Yet Mr Youssef's own record is not spotless. Apart from the fact that he was convicted of driving without insurance while Minister of Transport, he has a view of truth that is not in line with that of most Scots I know, Watch this clip for an example of what I see as the minister trying to get away with an untruth. The minister resigned due to him knowing an aide sabotaged, deliberately sabotaged a rape trial according to the judge. Allegedly, had, allegedly. I said allegedly, I did, allegedly I did say allegedly. You can check that in the tape. I've had a minister resign due to him knowing an aide sabotaged, deliberately sabotaged a rape trial according to the judge. Allegedly, They've had, allegedly. I said allegedly, I did say allegedly. You can check that in the tape. 
will Scots submit meekly to having their words called into question by forces under the command of the man you just saw? I sincerely hope not. My second point relates to the fact that there is nothing in Mr Yusuf's bill to prevent allegations of hate crime being made by children or people with a grudge against someone they dislike for some reason. This is something which all Soviet citizens were terrified of, and for good reason. There was the famous case of Pavlik Marozov, an aggressively puritanical young communist in the 1930s about whom many books have been written. He reported his father to the NKVD, the forerunner of the KGB, for some minor criminal infraction to do with the documentation of collective farm workers. The father was, in the eyes of his son, it seems, a kulak, a category which Stalin had declared to be enemies of the people. There was no love lost between father and son. But when you're 13 years old and at war with your parents, it's handy to have the National Thought Police on your side. After Public's report to the NKVD, his father was arrested and tried by a brutally informal tribunal which sent him to the Gulag for 10 years. There his sentence was changed to death and he was executed all on the uncorroborated word of a 13-year-old boy, just as could happen here if Mr Yusuf's bill is passed, since it sets aside the traditional Scottish requirement for corroboration in criminal cases. When hate is involved, the word of a single self-alleged victim, plus that of a police investigator, is enough to secure a conviction, just as in Stalin's Soviet Union. This is such an important point that I wish to illustrate it. There is no surviving film of Pavlik Marozov, but is a film extant of a speech made on a similar subject by Anastas Mikoyan, a senior member of the Politburo, who addressed an audience of the party faithful in the Bolshoi Theatre in 1937 on the subject of children who report their parents to the authorities. In this case, the boy is called Kolyo Zhiglov. He has reported his father for allegedly having stolen some fabric, since all property in the country was the property of the state, this was, of course, a crime against the people. Just watch the clip and notice the applause when Mikoyan says Zhiglov Sr. has been arrested. I show this because I see in it chilling echoes of the mass psychosis which affects the party faithful in a similar context in Scotland today. A short clip of that follows Mikoyan's speech. <laughs> Пионер Щеглов Коля в августе всего года сообщил официальным путем через почту начальнику района отдела МКВД о том, что его родной отец Щеглов Иван Николаевич занимается расчищением из совхоза строительных материалов. Был арестован. Пионер Коля Щеглов который знает, что такое советский власть для него, для всего народа. Увидав, что родной отец, он не, ему теперь не родной, он сказал НКВД, чтобы отца уничтожить как врага народа. Вот такие люди у нас, товарищи, есть. Вот такие пьяные у нас есть. Вот где наша сила и мощь в народе. It is a terrible state of affairs when Scots law has to be discussed in the same breath as Stalin's law. But the reason is simple. For the first time we have a bill before Parliament which aims to criminalise ordinary people's thoughts and attitudes. That, I need hardly add, has not been the British tradition since at least 1688, and certainly since the Enlightenment gave philosophical weight to the idea that diversity is a fundamental part of freedom. Before that, in 1603, James VI of Scotland went down to London to become James I of England too, 
He took with him Scottish ideas of constitutional propriety, which were more authoritarian than those in London at the time, and certainly much more authoritarian than those later on. In particular, the kings of Scotland felt they had a right to a measure of control over the thoughts of their subjects beyond mere outward religious observance. English kings had claimed that in the previous century, but before the Reformation, that was a power which was exercised by the Pope, not by the various kings of Europe. What I see Mr Youssef trying to do in this bill is to take the law in Scotland back to the time of King James, when the executive, which in those days meant the crown, but today means the cabinet, had power over the courts. That was possible because Parliament was deferential and because the King could sack judges who displeased him. Today the Parliament is equally deferential, but, thank goodness, the Cabinet has not the power to sack judges. However, we nearly did have that situation, as is discussed at some length in the Justice Factory. Astonishingly, it was a power which was given to the First Minister in the first draft of the Scotland Bill that Donald Dewar prepared in order to establish the Holyrood Parliament. It is only due to the power of the House of Lords, especially Lord McCluskey, a Labour peer incidentally, that such a totalitarian concept was defeated. I mention this and King James because of one incident which is important to recall in the context of the Hate Crime Bill. In 1607, four years after ascending to the English throne, James tried to foist a 17th century version of political correctness on the English with a so-called proclamation concerning conformity. I should say that proclamations at the time were in effect legislative acts issued by the Crown, though without parliamentary debate. Under James's proclamation, both Puritans and Papists were to be forced to conform with the high Anglican approach to religion, which James favoured. But the King had a formidable opponent in Sir Edward Cook, the great lawman of his day. Cook was a devout churchman, but he was also Chief Justice of Common Pleas. He took exception to James's intolerance of diversity and famously said, which was a courageous thing to do in the context of the time, Quote, no man ecclesiastical or temporal shall be examined upon secret thoughts of his heart or of his secret opinion. To me, Cook's dictum should be engraved on some granite block and deposited on the front steps of the Holyrood Parliament so that Mr. Yusuf can never avoid seeing it when he goes to work every day. His attempt to criminalise the inner thoughts and the normal conversation of Scottish people will take Scots law back to the 17th century, before Stair, before Mackenzie of Rosehall, before the 1688 revolution and the evolution of the rule of law. And that is why the subtitle of my book, The Justice Factory, is Can the Rule of Law Survive in 21st Century Scotland? Unfortunately, I think that is not a given. Mr Yousaf has said repeatedly in public that conversation in what used to be thought of as the privacy of the home can no longer safely be considered private if public order is not to be endangered. How he squares that with the Human Rights Act's article guaranteeing respect for family life, I do not know. Does he? If his bill goes through Parliament, private thoughts will become public business, rather as they were in Stalin's Soviet Union when the NKVD were trying to control the mind of the whole country. In effect, Mr Yousaf wants to abolish intimacy in Scotland and to strip-search the mind of every Scot. The wickedness of this lies in the fact that it can be combined with the lack of corroboration I have mentioned already so that anyone with a grievance against anyone else can, in the way that Pavlik Marozov and Kolya Zhiglov and the other child informers in Soviet history did, ensure that the object of their hatred be it father, neighbour, jilted lover or unwanted business competitor, be sent to the Scottish Gula for up to seven years by whispering the wrong word in the right ear. Not even in Mr Putin's Russia, which I think most people would agree is not in all respects a beacon of freedom and lawfulness in the world today, not even there are you in such danger from private speech. Article 51 of the Russian Constitution offers protection from evidence given by close relatives or family members. 
My final point relates to the fact that since Scottish people will continue to think and talk to family and friends, despite Mr Yousaf, and since many of us will think and express thoughts that he does not approve of, there will be a crisis of one sort or another. One sort of crisis will erupt if every alleged breach of the new law is reported and investigated, and the other sort of crisis will happen if, due to a lack of police numbers to conduct all the required investigations, it becomes common to be able to break the law and get away with it. In short, the law will either be mocked or it will be unenforceable. If Mr Yousaf's bill is passed into law, almost everyone will be vulnerable to prosecution, in most cases for thinking and behaving simply as they do now. But Scotland does not have enough jails to hold all the people who will be caught by the new morality police. So the likely situation will be that not everyone caught will be prosecuted. That may sound like good news, but it is in fact where the greatest danger lies. The government will be able to act against anyone they choose because, since the 2013 reforms, as also discussed in the Justice Factory, our police are closer to a continental-style state gendarmerie than a traditional British civilian force. Control has passed from local committees to central government. The police are now civil servants with guns, and ultimately they report to the Justice Minister, who is of course none other than Mr Yousaf himself. This will enable selective policing, which is the tactic of choice of all tyrants. Those who they dislike are prosecuted under some law or other, and those they like are never prosecuted. Anyone who is aware of Mr Putin's approach to law will know how easily this can be done in a state where everyone has broken some law or other, if only just to live as a normal citizen. Mere hints will be enough to bring normally independent-minded people to heel when they know that if the wrong person is rubbed up the wrong way, things could get ugly. Everyone will be kept off balance and worried by the thought that if the police decide to investigate them, they will have an easy route to convicting them of something. The result will be a dictator's dream, and incidentally the end of the rule of law, one of the fundamental tenets of which is that justice applied even-handedly to all. Scotland will become a country in which the population is prepared to self-censor, even in ordinary conversation. The surest way for any government to control its subject people is to abolish the privacy of friendship. That is what Mr Yousaf's hate crime bill will achieve. There is no objective standard for judging the words such as likely to stir up, insulting, abusive, or indeed hatred, that are used in Mr Yousaf's bill. So long as the law uses words loosely, we will all be on the defensive, self-censoring like Stalin's frightened subjects. We will be strangers in our own land. Will you dare to call someone a Christian when Section 3, Subsection 2 of Mr Yousaf's bill lays down that, quote, religion, or in the case of social or cultural groups, perceived religious affiliation, end quote, is a characteristic which, if discussed in a way the guardian of public morals deems unacceptable, could land you in jail. If you say the wrong thing about the Salvation Army, for example, since it is a group of people with a perceived religious affiliation, you could be sent to prison. Likewise, if you talked in a disparaging way about the Islamic State or the Daughters of the American Revolution, or of Paul Kruger's view as a Christian that the earth is flat, you could be liable just as much as if you tell jokes in the wrong circles about liquid pride, the right-wing Israeli LBGT organisation. The minefield is going to be as wide as the ocean. And that is where the great opportunity for ambitiously oppressive government lies. With the hate crime bill, the only totally safe course will never be to say anything to anyone about anybody or anything beyond practical matters or possibly the weather. Even football will struggle to pass a conventional risk assessment. That was roughly what the Soviet system achieved under Stalin. The damage to the social fabric has not yet been repaired. There is still a terrifying degree of social atomization in Russia. To Mr Putin, a vibrant community is a dangerous community. The result is no community. The result of that is that it is almost impossible for society to challenge those in power over them. That will doubtless suit Mr Yousaf and his white cabinet colleagues. 
Under this bill, once anyone has been accused by a single individual of thinking in a prohibited fashion, the burden of proof will be on the accused to convince the court that he or she did not think in ways that the guardian of public morals says are the only legitimate contents of thought in Scotland. That is another offence against the rule of law and indeed traditional Scottish judicial practice. That was exactly how Soviet justice worked under the NKVD and the KGB, in front of whom there was no presumption of innocence. If the state decided it did not like the cut of your jib, it could easily find a way of convicting you of something. That method of control depended upon almost everyone being guilty of something. But, and this is the key point, without the state having to prove it. Since devolution, the Scottish state has become increasingly intolerant of its citizens. The Parliament has created new offences here at twice the rate the English Parliament has within its own jurisdiction. This has been demonstrated by some remarkable legal research by the Regis Professor of Law at the University of Glasgow, John Chalmers. Together with another scholar from the same university, Professor Fiona Leverick, he has been studying the rate at which the Scottish Government has been legislating to create new crimes. In his inaugural lecture on appointment to the Regis Chair, Professor Chalmers gave a table of, quote, the total number of offences created in England and Scotland 1997-8 and 2010-11. It will immediately be noted that the first date is before devolution and the second is three years after the SNP formed its first government. In the first period, the rate of criminalisation of life was approximately equal in Scotland and in England, while in the second, under an SNP government, Scotland was using the heavy hammer, as one of the old judges put it in my book, in a way that worried both professors. In a joint article in the Edinburgh Law Review reporting their research, Professors Chalmers and Leverick comment, quote, Holyrood showed a far greater propensity to create criminal offences than Westminster. The bare figures are astonishing, end quote. After analysing the types of offence created, they summarise as follows. Quote again, Holyrood appears to have great difficulty in regulating without criminalising. Legislation which is not on its face criminal will include a regulatory scheme backed up by criminal penalties, such as failing to register transfers of land or changes of landlord under the Crofting Reform Scotland Act 2010, or failing to comply with notices under the Historic Environment Amendment Scotland Act 2011. Holyrood's propensity to create criminal offences is a cause for concern. It is hardly necessary to emphasise that mass criminalisation of private life in Scotland as a result of the hate crime bill will result in a radically increased cause for concern. The most charitable explanation I can think of for Mr Youssef's bill is that he does not know enough about Scottish legal history or the interrelated development of law and Scottish society to see what an important tradition he is in the point of destroying. Alternatively, he does know, but he doesn't care, or rather he thinks he has a higher priority than encouraging respect for the rule of law. Freedom under law is a delicate construct, built up over centuries of public acceptance of the legitimate purposes of lawmaking for the common good. This can quickly degenerate into tyranny when a governing elite feels it can ignore the public and use law as a weapon rather than a neutral arbiter. To use a sporting metaphor, when the ref takes sides, it is game over. Either way, the effect of this bill will be to take Scottish thought into public ownership in the name of a cause favoured by the governing elite. The nationalisation of attitudes in Scotland will outlaw freedom of communication by making human interaction dependent on government approval. By forcing everyone to conform to the elite view of right thought and acceptable communication by threats of jails or fines, the bill is really a form of government bullying which will be facilitated by informers who are prepared to betray the sanctity of friendship. Like Collier Zhigloff and Pavlik Morozov, these people will consider their first duty is to the state 
and only after that to their friends, relatives, family or even business partners. That, of course, was Stalin's approach to governance and Hitler's, incidentally, as is mentioned in my first book shorts film on the Germanic Isle. I'm not, of course, suggesting that Mr. Yustaf is a Nazi or even a Stalinist. However, on both counts, it is important to stress that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Even if Mr. Yusuf's intentions are entirely altruistic, that is not good enough. We all remember Tony Blair and the Second Iraq War. We, the voting public, have to be aware of just how easily good aims, and I do not think all the aims of this bill are good, but even if we assume they are, how easily good aims can turn to moral dust and ashes. Those of which my book recommendation number 58 about Bruce Lockhart and the Lockhart plot will recall the fact that the great criminal of the Cheka, the forerunner of the NKVD and the KGB and the Soviet Secret Service generally, Felix Dzerzhinsky, drowned in blood while, as he thought it, he was creating paradise on earth. But the Soviet initiative has always been recognised as having at least an element of altruism in it. The Nazi regime has had very little, and therefore I'd like to read a quote that I used in the Justice Factory right at the end to make this point, since it comes from a modern German historian who has written a book about the history of law in Nazi Germany. His name is Jens Meyer Heinrich. His book is called The Remnants of the Reichstag, subtitled An Ethnography of Nazi Law. On page 148, we come to a section entitled Nazi Legal Conscience. And Meyer Heinrich says this, Much has been written in recent years about Nazi morality. Now, this book was published in 2018, not very long ago, by Oxford University Press. It is at once enlightening and utterly disturbing to think that policies which culminated in the destruction of the European Jews could have started out as moral sentiments. That is the most important sentence I think I could stress in relation to this bill. And yet they did. And he quotes another German historian, Claudia Kuntz, who says as follows, the final solution did not develop as evil incarnate, but rather as the dark side of ethnic righteousness. Never forget that, the dark side of righteousness. Talk about the road to hell being paved with good intentions. The danger in this changed relationship of the people to their rulers is that it will open the way to state terrorism of the sort that we see today on the streets of Minsk. Lukashenko's principles may seem to us to have little to do with Mr. Yusuf and his hate crime bill. Such a naked use of force against the ordinary citizen may seem alien to Scottish experience and therefore hardly credible as a threat. However, Lukashenko is, in this respect, little different from Butcher Cumberland, who, as is well known to most Scots, was not content to scatter the Jacobite army at Culloden, but went on to initiate a programme of what today would be called ethnic cleansing, Gallic society was viewed in official Edinburgh and Imperial London with much the same level of horror and contempt as a lack of political correctness is today. Having taken the police into public ownership, the Scottish Government no longer has to maintain the fiction of policing by consent. Naked force is what is proposed in this bill. My prediction is that if it works as the government hopes it will, there will be another great emigration or even clearance as there was after Cumberland's troops, the majority of whom were Scots, incidentally, had inflicted an 18th century version of the metropolitan woke culture onto the remnants of the Gallic world. 
Just as the more enterprising elements of Highland society left for North America and other colonies after Culloden, so modern Scots with some vitality left in them will try to find a life beyond the reach of Mr Yousaf's informers, stool pigeons and clipes, and of his well-armed, black-clad thought police. All talented, creative, enterprising, or just ordinarily sociable people will be tempted to leave a country which has abandoned the rule of law and the principle of reciprocity being the rulers and the ruled, neither of which I think Mr Yousaf understands. The result will be to turn Scotland into a cultural and social desert, poisoned by a dead conformism and corroded by the conceit of the petty municipal self-righteousness which we already see oozing from this government, like adipose from a corpse. of people. What a beautiful sight you all are. You're gorgeous. My God. We're in Glasgow. Glasgow is a city where migrants have contributed so much. They've contributed to our business, to our academia, to our NHS, and even to our food. Thank God. This is the home of the chicken tikka masala. Uh, yes. Wait. Wait. <laughs>